Hello, everyone. It's an honor and pleasure for me to open this uh, online policy roundtable today. Uh, my name is Jutta Schulze Holmen. I'm the resource director at the European Parliamentary Research Service. Um, this is the second such online event DGE Paris organizes, obviously, due to the ongoing um, COVID 19 crisis. I wish to welcome um, our distinguished guests, our panelists, and of course, also our interested audience. And I see that more and more colleagues connect as I speak. Um, very happy to see you join. We will have uh, 90 minutes uh, to talk about the fascinating topic of the path towards a circular economy for plastics. As you see from the title already, plastics and the circular economy, obviously this is not a, a natural um, marriage between the two. Uh, I'm particularly happy to uh, welcome two prominent guests, um, Member of Parliament Jan Hötema, who should connect in a minute. I can't see him yet. And uh, Professor uh, Michael Norton, uh, who comes back to us. Welcome back, Professor Norton from the ASAC, of course, your director um, of the environment program there. Um, and you will present uh, your recent report on pa packaging plastics in their circular economy. While we're waiting for Jan Hötema, a few words on the topic. Obviously, you all know that the European Green Deal has been confirmed at the, as the top priority of the von der Leyen Commission. The Circular Economy Action Plan is a major building block of the European Green Deal. Um, as you know, the, the Commission has presented this building block back in March. And our event is actually very timely as the Environment Committee is currently uh, considering the uh, own initiative report of which Mr. Hoytema actually is the rapporteur. Expectations are high. That's why I'm particularly happy that we um, reinforce our partnership with the EASAC, the U European Academic Science Advisory Council. Um, and obviously we, we have here a very similar mandate at the, the EPRS. Uh, plastics as such is a topic that's very tangible. We all grew up with it and plastics have had, if I may say so, a quite particular career in inverted commas from being praised in the early 20th century um, to being seen much more skeptically uh, after the Second World War uh, and from being investigated as regards the environmental um, impact in the 1780s. Um, and um, having lost even more reputation um, when the when health concerns came into play, and and that aspect has also been increasingly researched, as you, as most of you will will know. Despite this growing mistrust, it's true it's a vital um, element for our modern life, and that's why I'm personally convinced it's very important that we look that science looks into safer and sustainable options. Again, welcome to everyone. I can not see Mr. Hoytema being connected yet. I therefore suggest um, that we start with the expertise of uh, Professor Michael Norton. Um, I will very briefly introduce you. Um, I said already, Director of the Environment Program at the ASAC. Um, you also established a parliamentary office uh, of science and technology at Westminster in the UK. And you were for a very long time, uh, you held various professorships in Tokyo, Japan, amongst others at the Tokyo Institute of Technology and the Chinshu University. I hope my pronunciation is correct. Uh, pleased to hear from you. And we will then take the intervention of um, Rapporteur Mr. Hoytema. Thank you very much, Professor Norton. Okay. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for your welcome, and thank you very much for organizing this. As you know very well, we um, released this report uh, on packaging plastics in the circular economy 
um, uh, six months ago now in March. And uh, whereas we were successful in launching it at the Belgian Academies in March the 11th, the schedule we had for talking to you the following week had to be postponed due to the rapid growth in the uh, pandemic. Uh, so um, very, very many thanks for re revitalizing this and allowing us to continue our, our debate. But already six months has gone by. When, when ESAC uh, uh, decides to conduct a study, it uh, has to call on all its 28 Academy members in Europe for contributions of expertise. And the whole process is very thorough and peer reviewed and so it takes time. So when we decided to do this, it was already uh, two and a half years ago in late 2017, 2018. And at that time, the reasons we decided to um, look at this issue were several. Um, there were the um, public concerns uh, triggered by programs like Blue Planet on the direct and rather uh, uncomfortably seen effects on marine life of various types of plastic. Um, we had the, um, the scandals of uh, so-called recycled plastics turning up abandoned in Malaysian forests or other countries' uh, tips uh, under the guise of being recycled. And we had also that um, uh, customer reaction, negative reaction to the uh, addition of microbeads, plastic microbeads in cosmetics, toothpaste and such. And that coincided with, as you mentioned, a high priority within the Commission for seeing packaging plastics as one of the first targets of its circular economy initiative. And uh, the Commission has continued to uh, conduct work in plastics with its single use plastic directive uh, since. So when we started, it was already a hot topic and uh, I don't think it's changed in the two years it took us to uh, uh, since then. Uh, what we started with was the um, really the analysis that's, that plastics in the in marine environment is really what we would call a social trap. We don't have industries designing plastics to be put into the marine environment. We don't have many consumers uh, who are deliberately uh, throwing their plastic into the marine environment, but it happens anyway, despite our best intention. And that implies to, implied to us at the beginning a systems failure. So very much we looked at this from a systems point of view, and I'll be going through briefly the main points emerging from that. And of course, we can talk in more detail during the discussion. So why do we have this systems failure? And first of all, the system is very complicated and very long. We have the start of the uh, plastics packaging system as the monomer producers, the oil companies, who are still um, uh, build, uh, building additional plant. And that, that goes through the resin, the, uh, the plastic um, raw materials, the uh, additives, and ends up in retail in the customer's hands and then ends up being um, disposed of at end of life. And that involves up to a billion people at the end of the chain and maybe a hundred companies involved at the start of the chain. So it's a rather complicated system and we needed to think about whether those parts of the system were actually working together. So if I could start with the slides, if someone could put them on the screen. Please. Hmm. Yeah, so move straight to the second slide, please. We found quite a number of system conflicts in just, just to start off with. We have uh, different parts of the system trying to go in different, uh, different directions. The monomer producers are investing huge billions of investment in expanding capacity on the uh, linear assumption that plastic demand for packaging is going to continue growing at three to four percent a year. We have the perpetual problem in, in our economies that external social and environmental costs are not included. So virgin resin is almost, almost always cheaper than recycled resin. Uh, we have the design priorities of marketing and uh, uh, conv customer convenience, really having recycling uh, uh, ability fairly low on the, on the checklist and retailers focused on operational efficiency attractive to customers, again, 
seeing recyclability as an afterthought. We also have the customers who've become very, very uh, almost uh, <coughs> um, dedicated to on the go, uh, easy to go disposal culture. And back, uh, behind that is a, a severe lack of choice in, and availability of cost effective recycling capacity for the end of life products. So that if we move on to the next slide, <clears throat> that means we need to think of the whole thing as a as a system when we design regulatory objectives. And the next one, please. <clears throat> um, and putting this into the context of the very simple context of the circular economy, <clears throat> we have, uh, first of all, the demand for plastics is higher than it really should be because we don't have correct pricing. And the objective of the circular economy is fundamentally to reduce material flows through the system. So that is a fundamental conflict with the objective of some of the members of the system who are trying to still increase that material flow. We also have to bear another background limitation is that plastics are in incredibly useful. The reason they are so widespread is because they are useful, they're cheap, they're cost effective, they produce a whole range of options and capabilities which uh, we, we have come to require. <clears throat> And it is not a simple thing as saying we can't use plastic or we can substitute plastics for anything else. In general, we have to live with plastics and aim for a balance, a better balance between the benefits we get from it while reducing the costs to the environment. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Dealing with the um, uh, regulatory environment is quite complex and the Commission has been doing an excellent job on that. Um, I've only got time in my remaining 10 minutes to flag a few headlines here of some of the regulatory uh, tools which are being developed <clears throat> and which we've analysed in, in, in more detail in the report. And the main headline regulatory report, uh, re regulatory tool is really EPR, Expended Producer Responsibility, where <clears throat> users of plastic packaging are meant to pay a contribution to the social and environmental costs, and that in turn is meant to steer uh, user behaviour towards a more uh, circular economy. In many member states, that's, <clears throat> that's simply not been working. The system has not been designed properly. It's been too cheap, and basically, no had zero effect on uh, manufacturer and retailer choices. On some other member states, such as Italy is a good leader, and <clears throat> they have developed quite a good system where the charges are not, not only high enough to influence behaviour, but uh, structured in detail to steer plastic use towards a more uh, circular mo mode. So we very much enc encourage not only much higher fees, but also what we call echo modulation to ensure that <clears throat> users who emphasise recycling were rewarded and those who ignored or included <clears throat> additives which actually impede recycling were to some extent penalised. Key point is not to have any loopholes in this and with the increasing uh, reliance on online shopping, particularly exacerbated by COVID, uh, we need to make sure that is all included in EPR systems. Moving on to the next slide. <clears throat> Uh, consumer behaviour is uh, a topic that's widely uh, discussed. We include a, a, a large review of that, and in fact, uh, the Commission SAPIA also did a big review on consumer behaviour. Um, <clears throat> you can spend a lot of time discussing the social, behavioural and psychological aspects of that, but the bottom line we conclude is pretty simple. Consumers respond to price, and that's the financial incentives that have driven a relatively successful and effective uh, plastic bag charges and also drive an excellent recovery rate for beverage containers in countries which are using deposit return schemes. So <clears throat> we can't rely basically on people's goodwill. We need to include that in terms of uh, direct uh, uh, rewards or in cases uh, or restrictions. Also, when we think of that, some manufacturers do tend to think, well, we're just responding to consumer demand. <clears throat> but consumer choice is very much 
limited by the choices presented by manufacturers and retailers. So again, we tend to say consumers should not be relied on for dealing with this problem on their own. We need to focus on the legal entities, the manufacturers and retailers, make sure that consumers are offered appropriate choices and also offered simple solutions to the recycling challenge. Next, uh, we looked at um, technical issues in the next slide. This is a major weakness which we have identified and tried to contribute to. Um, <clears throat> basically, recycling of plastics is only economic for high quality um, materials collected for PET and to Olympix exchange HDP containers. And then outside that, recycling is pretty difficult, if not impossible, to and recycle because of the complex mixtures, the differences in resins, additives, <clears throat> all of which make um, mixed waste plastic so um, so difficult and uneconomic that that is really fed this um, so-called export for so-called recycling, which has led to such major pollution impacts in the, re in the receiving countries and um, in some cases having those so-called uh, recycling waste sent back in the containers in which they arrive to the sending countries. We basically say until Europe gets its house in order by providing better recycling capabilities, that should be temporarily suspended. And even when uh, the Basel Convention brings in its new requirements, that should be a relatively limited output. And our objective should be a whole range of recycling options which can handle mixed plastics so they don't have to go to landfill and don't have to go to inefficient um, incineration. We see great potential for actually making recycling easier if only manufacturers and retailers could simplify the types of polymers, resins and additives they use. And we think there are quite significant technological options there for limiting um, the range of uh, end of life products which the recycling industry has to deal with. <clears throat> Moving on to the next issue, which was basically the um, starting point, it's the environmental issues. There's no real de debate about the deleterious effects on the marine environment. There is uh, a lot more discussion about uh, effects in the terrestrial environment of um, leakage from agricultural plastic or other sources, <clears throat> but there's little evidence that any of it can be beneficial. Um, the EU is doing a very comprehensive, the Commission is doing a very comprehensive approach to trying to reduce further plastic sources into EU waters from fishing, from agriculture, from aquaculture. And, and the main problem of direct inputs to the oceans does remain in Asia and Africa, and therefore is a subject which the Commission could encourage to be on the international aid agenda. The big scientific debate and the big public debate also is on the microplastics and nanoplastics. Um, microplastics come from the degradation of the macroplastics <clears throat> and so it's perfectly appropriate to stay, keep the regulatory focus on macroplastics for the time being. But in the longer term, should we be worried and how worried should we be about microplastics and the contamination which is now spreading across the globe from the north to the south poles? on the surface waters, the deepest ocean, and now being capable of being detected in our drinking water, beer, uh, seafood, and, and uh, in, in, in detectable quantities. So the question is, how do we assess the risk from that? A standard evidence-based risk analysis does not suggest any immediate short-term acute effects. But the question is, are we comfortable with gradually parts of our global environment gradually accumulating even more of the, uh, of the materials. And that's where we really do need a debate uh, based on how far should we apply the precautionary principle here. Uh, again, a lot of issues to follow through. Um, fi the final big issue we, we mentioned here <coughs> is, the, uh, is the bio word, if I can have the next slide. Um, bio comes in in quite a number of cases. We have the substitution of fossil fuels by uh, biological feedstocks, whether that's uh, foodstuffs or, or, or residues. 
we have uh, biological mechanisms capable of delivering new types of plastics, such as uh, PHA, PLA and such. And we have the bio word in terms of what happens when it gets into the environment. Is it biodegradable or compostable? This is a very complicated issue and uh, one where, from a marketing standpoint, some companies have tended to rather oversimplify by really pushing the idea that bio means green, which means it must always be good. We pointed out that that's not the case and that if manufacturers make those claims, they should at least be able to show some data to support that. Um, but we also point out that there's still a lot of potential there in R&D for really refining and exploiting some of the biological processes to try and produce plastics which do really biodegrade in the environment. At the moment, the ones that meet certain criteria, the criteria are not sufficient to render them unharmful in the environment, and we see a lot of scope of further research there. Also complications, this system is not simple, you can't just label something as biodegradable, you need to think about <clears throat> also how it's going to be biodegraded, and there, we've already, already hit problems there with the uh, composting label where composting is not always achievable in the, in the uses to which it's been sold, as well as disrupting recycling. So our report tries to look at a lot of these systemic issues and a lot of these particular issues I just mentioned on. Uh, one final comment I'll make is that um, rather in the final slide, in the few days before we launched this initial report, it was very good to see that the European Plastics Pact was announced. And within that European Plastic Pact, which is part of the global efforts of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, that you can see a lot of similarities between our objectives and principles and those of the leaders who have chosen to sign up to the European Plastic Pact. So the problem is not so much a disagreement about what we should be trying to do. Uh, the, the devil is also in, always in the detail, and that comes down to what appropriate regulations <clears throat> are going to achieve what appropriate objectives. And also recently we've seen that when you, when you compare the um, actions of some of the uh, players in the plastic industries, they're not always unitary. Uh, we have um, some, some investigations which have shown that while uh, some companies are promising this in their PR, they're not always um, <coughs> stopping lobbying against certain restrictions. So we need to continue to work to get the manufacturers to work with the regulators and with co the local authorities and consumers and NGOs. So we do actually make sure we're working together to try and achieve our common objectives. So I, I submit, I sincerely look forward to our panel discussion and hope that this very short overview I've given them the analysis is, is helpful in getting the discussion going. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Professor Norton, for this comprehensive overview. Uh, my name is Vivienne Alleux. I will be the moderator for this event. Um, before turning to our next speaker, here is Mr. Heutema. I would like to remind the audience that um, they can um, submit their questions at any time during the event. Uh, by using the Q&A toolbox at uh, the bottom right of the screen. During the Q&A time, I will read them out and um, I will uh, address them to our speakers. Um, but now I would like to give the floor to Mr. Heutema, who is a member of the European Parliament Committee on the Environment, Public Health and Food Safety and is the rapporteur on um, the new Circular Economy Action Plan. Uh, Mr. Heutema, the floor is yours. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Vivienne. I hope you can hear me uh, well. Uh, thank you so much uh, for this invitation and uh, the possibility to speak here. Uh, maybe to short introduce myself, I'm um, a politician from uh, the Netherlands. I'm now a member of uh, six years. I have a engineering, agriculture engineering background. Um, I was always fascinated by circular economy, especially in agriculture. A lot of nice examples 
uh, are already been done there and uh, I think a lot can uh, be uh, still can be done um, I'm the rapporteur of the Parliament uh, for uh, for this uh, as a reaction to the Commission's action plan uh, for a circular economy um, and maybe to start with why I think this is such an important uh, uh, topic I think it's an important topic because it really ticks the boxes of people planet profit and maybe to start with the last one, profit. I really see that circular economy can be of a competitive advantage for the European Union. Or maybe it's the main instrument that we have for the future to, be, to remain uh, competitive. Um, because we are not a continent with uh, so much different uh, resources, so rare earth materials. Uh, we're also not a continent with uh, low wages countries. Um, but what we lack in those, we make up with uh, knowledge and innovation power. And I really think we can make a difference uh, in the global world uh, for the future. Uh, second to that, I think it's important to, to think about circular economy to be less dependent for the import of resources from third countries. I think and also the corona uh, has shown us how uh, vulnerable our value chains uh, can be. So it's uh, something we should uh, think about. Then on the, 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 the planet, I think circular economy is the main instrument to reach the Green Deal uh, targets, for example, on, on climate, but also on environmental pollution. I think that, uh, that is key. And then the social aspect, well, in the action program, you've seen a lot of aspects like, for example, uh, durability, reusability, things that are of very much concern of, uh, of consumers. But also, I believe that with circular economy, if we really step it up, that we can uh, create uh, additional jobs uh, for within uh, the European Union. So that is why I think it's, it, it is important and uh, as a politician, and I stress all the time as a politician, because that's how I wrote this report. I don't see myself as an expert. I don't see myself as somebody in, an, in, an, in an, a big uh, glass tower that knows it all. Uh, I don't. But uh, what I want is really to make a good response to the action program or action plan of the Commission by um, visiting a lot of stakeholders. Well, because of Corona, especially in the Netherlands, to see what is necessary in practice. What does uh, the stakeholders, what does businesses need from the policy uh, makers in a way to scale up a circular economy? And what I realized that a lot, a lot, a lot can be done, uh, but it's difficult to do so. And uh, basically that has to do with two uh, reasons. And the professor highlighted them. I think it's indeed a competition of secondary raw materials compared to virgin materials and it's uh, the availability of quality uh, and safe uh, supply of uh, secondary raw materials um, and indeed like the professor highlighted is that um, we mentioned i mentioned in my report a couple of instruments in order to get a little bit of a better level playing field or even more a plus for secondary raw, raw materials to compete with virgin. So you can think indeed about tax measures. Uh, I think public pure procurement is a very important one. I think also the government should lead by example. Uh, but what is sometimes overlooked, but I think is an important uh, aspect there, is that a lot of climate and CO2 legislation have some reward elements in it. And I think it uh, would be very good if secondary raw materials really get the benefit of the CO2 rewards and that this CO2 benefits are uh, distributed evenly be between, uh, within the supply chain. That also, for example, somebody who is demolishing and sort uh, waste out can have some benefits of uh, the CO2 reward and not only the end producer. Then, of course, uh, indeed, the extended producer responsibility um, and we talk always about fees, but I would like to see if we can have also extended producer opportunities in a way that it's a unique selling point and it's likely for the consumer to, to buy such a, such a product. You see some examples of, for example, in the mobile phone industry that they are using a waste compensation programs. So, for example, that for every phone they sell, they collect a one phone. Uh, wherever in the world. So to really have a one out, uh, one in uh, principle. Uh, and then it comes to me for the supply. You see that sometimes indeed 
uh, waste is not uh, in the correct way uh, collected. It's still polluted in the environment, like the professor was saying. Uh, you can indeed uh, think about deposit schemes or indeed those waste, waste compensation programs. But I think also you have to look broader to the whole waste, European Waste from Directive and really create a single market uh, for waste. And an important one that I highlight that we should not also export our waste problems to third countries. And uh, that can be sometimes very tricky and sometimes even there are financial uh, stimulus there that we really should uh, tackle. Um, again, the mobile phones, uh, a lot of mobile phones are being sold second-handed to, for example, African countries, and there they go out in a waste, and uh, those materials don't come back to the European Union. And if you, for example, want to get them back to the European Union, uh, it is quite def difficult uh, to uh, uh, import it back because it's considered as waste and you have a lot of restrictions there. So you see the, the problems uh, for policy. And um, I found out that a lot of existing policies can uh, also uh, 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 interfere with becoming real uh, circular. Um, of course, it's always with good intentions that legislations are there, but they can have uh, negative effects as well. For example, I've been visiting uh, a startup that is using bio waste to use the nutrients, but also, for example, the fatty acids to make, for example, paint, but they have to compete with co-insulation uh, 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 yeah, co uh, factories uh, because they even get in some countries uh, additional uh, subsidy uh, to use those uh, bio waste. And uh, so that's an extra, uh, <laughs> extra difficult uh, for those startups to compete uh, with, uh, with them. Um, I think, and, and indeed, like I said, and, and, and Quality of supply is much needed, what I've heard a lot from, uh, from, from businesses. And therefore, I think the whole idea of the European Commission to come forward, for example, with a pro product passport or at least some sort of a track and trace and that we as European Union can certify such a track and trace that you exactly know uh, where the secondary uh, uh, materials are, are come from. Uh, being said that, I think... Um, we, of course, should start with the most important aspect, and that is indeed uh, prevent that there will be waste anyway. Uh, so in my report, I really tackle the idea of uh, designing out of uh, waste. 80% of the environment impact of, uh, of materials are determined by the design phase. So uh, I mentioned a lot how we can make design in such a way that it's better, that it's longer lasting, so more durable, better repairable better reusable, also the components can be better reusable, uh, and that it has an, uh, an, uh, an, an, an uh, recycling content uh, of it, and also uh, using those materials that can be recyclable. Specific for plastics, I named uh, three articles of two, three paragraphs. Uh, I uh, reiterate again uh, the objective to make all packaging uh, reusable uh, or recyclable in an economic viable way, of course, in, uh, by 2030. And also calls uh, the Commission uh, to present a an, uh, an legislative pr proposal uh, uh, with measures to reduce excessive packaging and uh, promote reuse. Um, of course, important one, and I, I, I put it there as well, that we should underline uh, the essential role that packaging has uh, for product uh, safety. Uh, in particular, of course, uh, food safety and hygiene. And uh, uh, I think uh, we can only uh, encourage in initiatives such as the, the circular plastics uh, initiative. And then indeed, uh, also on the microplastics, uh, we say that uh, the European Co Commission should really uh, try to find a way, uh, a comprehensive way to phase out intense, intentionally added microplastics, uh, uh, for example and uh, close the gaps in scientific knowledge and uh, microplastics. That being said, and that's my final point, uh, I always, I really like innovation. And I think a lot of innovation can be done. And sometimes there is still some sort of a dogma of recycling products that are not be safe or indeed uh, uh, the quality is low and that some, some of the techniques to recycle them by uh, are not the best way forward. For example, chemical recycling sometimes has the name in it, chemical recycling, that mm, some uh, political groups in the parliament don't, don't like it. But I think it's essential to have it. So, of course, uh, with a lot of can be done with mechanical recycling. But on top of that, I think to really closing the loop, we should find other enhanced recycling methods such as uh, chemical uh, recycling. And uh, I think uh, we should focus much more on uh, those uh, new innovations. Overall, uh, 
uh, also the whole thing, well, well, how should we choose? Eh? Should we indeed go for bioplastics? Should we go for maybe multi-layer of plastics uh, so to reduce the amount of plastics? It all comes to a good life cycle analysis indeed. Like the professor saying, bioplastics are not always the best choice. Uh, multi-layers uh, maybe are reducing uh, the amount of plastics, but um, uh, in a way uh, very difficult to recycle again. So we have to take the, all those things ac into account. Uh, I started with saying that I'm a uh, politician and not, not an expert. So all these points that I just mentioned, I got from the field uh, and people were uh, suggesting this to me. I would like to give you all the participants here the same offer. Uh, please read uh, the report and, uh, and uh, please send me some suggestions, if any, for amendments. Uh, we have until the 22 of October, uh, the deadline is uh, to table any amendments. And I really need your brain power and uh, your uh, experiences uh, to really uh, 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 put uh, the circular economy uh, to a next phase and really upscale uh, this. Because what I said, I had the feeling that a lot can be done. And people are thinking of it. Uh, people are really see, seeing also this win-win situation. Uh, but sometimes for example, like regulation or financially or maybe other barriers are there. And uh, I would like to give you the opportunity uh, to give input to me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Eutema, for this clear uh, outline of uh, the key issues, the challenges and opportunities for the circular economy, uh, which I think uh, perfectly sets the scene for today's discussion. Um, so we will now hear um, the views of our three panelists. Um, the first speaker is um, Lars Volker Mortensen, he is an expert in product uh, consumption and plastic at the European Environment Agency in Copenhagen. Um, Lars is the author of several reports on the circular economy and sustainability. And uh, today he will share um, latest EEA knowledge on the issue. So um, Lars, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me to join this uh, interesting roundtable. Good to be here. I'm certainly not a politician, but uh, I've been working on sustainable consumption production for 25 years now. So that's the perspective I, I come with uh, here. I sit here in Copenhagen in the European Environment Agency and looking outside, the sun is shining and it's a blue sky. And I hope it looks the same where you're from. I, I've heard it's been cold in Brussels uh, lately. Uh, so basically, I'll talk about uh, plastics, the circular economy, and also Europe's uh, environment, which is uh, what we look at. So, uh, Cecilia, if you will show the slides, that would be very nice. Move on to the next one. So, I have uh, three points to share with uh, you today. First is my reflections on the report on packaging plastics by the European Academy's uh, Science Advisory Council that was just presented to us. Secondly, I will present some uh, basically a sneak preview into our, our knowledge base from the forthcoming EA report on which we call Plastic, the Circular Economy and Europe's Environment, which we will publish in January. And third, I want to talk about three pathways towards circularity in plastic uh, production and uh, consumption. As you can see here from the picture, recycling or reuse is not always as easy as it uh, seems. And in this case, it depends also a bit on, on, on the size of, uh, of the child. If you move on to the next slide, please. So my first point is that uh, I welcome very much the report. Uh, it was a shame that uh, it got caught in Corona, but it's really good to see it presented here. I think it's very solid. I, th I really like the way it challenges the linear plastics economy, the systems perspective, and provides a lot of very concrete uh, policy options, which I think will be very useful uh, to the politicians. So that's my, my main point. But when reading it, and I realize the report started a number of years ago, and, and since then, perhaps the plastic discussion has also become a bit broader. And, and I think perhaps it could have been interesting to see the report addressing uh, uh, other use of plastics, for example, in building, in transport, electronics, uh, and textiles, because I think that also provides some inputs to the, to, to the policy making. For example, on, on, on textiles, I think not that many people know actually that between 60 and 70 percent of textiles actually made from, uh, from from plastics uh, for use in, in synthetic uh, fibers. 
And then my third and final point is that, and this is my most important point, I think to some extent I miss impacts other than, than those that are mentioned in the report, which is made mainly focusing on leaking into the environment. I think the greenhouse gas emissions is, is, is a huge issue. When we talk about plastics, uh, so is the pollution and the human health impacts, which was also which was also mentioned. So that could have been nice, but maybe in, in the next reports. If you move on to the next slide, I will move on to my, my, my second point. And this is uh, the sneak review into our, our report that we will publish in, in January. This uh, illustration that you see here basically is our EA vision of, of, of the circular economy. Many of you have seen it before, perhaps. Uh, in the middle, the, the dark green, you know, we, we show how reuse, repair, distribution, refurbishment, and remanufacturing can be a vehicle to enable the circular economy through the whole, uh, through the whole value chain, basically. And what I've tried to do, do here is basically uh, illustrate uh, what are some of the challenges uh, with plastics, because plastics consumption production, as we see it now, is, is very linear and, and, and is by no means uh, circular. So basically what we can see is that uh, plastic is basically mainly based on fossil fuels, 90% of it is. Uh, the share of recycled plastics in new products is very low. Most plastics are of low value, low cost and short life. Also most plastics are designed to be used only once and are not designed, designed for, for repeated use or circularity. Plastic is produced with additives often making it more hazardous and de decreasing recyclability. Plastics are often used for short-lived products. Plastic causes leakage to the environment and hazardous substances, and the recycling rates for, for plastics are very low. As you can see from that, I think we have quite a big uh, challenge uh, uh, ahead of us. The picture you see here is from a, a beach I visited recently in Denmark, where you can actually collect the waste on the beach, which is, which, which is kind of nice. On the next page, uh, I just want to show a bit more about from the report that we're coming out with. Basically, uh, the analytical content we have there is that first we look at the consumption, production, and the trade of plastics from a European perspective. Basically, in terms of consumption, basically the consumption and use of plastic increases uh, year by year. That's uh, common knowledge. Uh, Actually, quite a lot of plastic is produced within Europe, uh, up to 20% of, of the total world uh, production of plastics is in Europe. And in terms of, of the trade of plastics, we also know the story that basically we've been exporting a lot of our, our, our plastic waste uh, until around uh, 2017, when with China put a ban on it, we've started to export less than the tendency is with the new rules, that we will not be able to export our plastic waste anymore, which means we have to handle it ourselves. That gives some challenges, but I think also also a lot of uh, opportunities. Then we've looked at the environment and climate impacts of plastics. And what we've done is basically we've looked at each phase of the life cycle. So first on the, what are the impacts of uh, extracting oil and gas uh, for plastics? That's basically, there's a lot of re resource issue from a non-renewable -re resource, everything from the extraction, a lot of greenhouse gas emissions, and there's also a lot of pollution in, in that process. And I think that's, Often not part of the debate, I would say, on plastic. There's a, these are huge issues. We are looking at, so we looked also at the impacts of production, the significant impacts on greenhouse gas emissions uh, uh, and on, on pollution. And actually, I think there's quite a big uh, potential in the climate debate perhaps to look at, at plastic and how, how can you save uh, greenhouse gas emissions from, from plastics, uh, from extraction of the plastics, from impacts of production, but also from the, the incineration. Then we've looked at impacts of the consumption, littering, and microplastics, which many others have also done. Uh, you know, the plastics, plastics in the environment and the, the problems related to that, but also the chemical toxicity and the health issues. Because it's also common knowledge that actually uh, plastic has been known and the, 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 uh, what is in the plastics has been known to cause uh, to harm, harms to humans. And of course, we have to be very careful with that. And then finally, we've looked at the impacts of waste management. Uh, the landfilling, incineration, and, and, and different recycling options. Uh, and then uh, we look at the road ahead, and we have to identify three pathways towards a circular plastics economy. In the next uh, slide, I just want to go through with you what those pathways are. Uh, of course, we've looked a lot at what is in, in the current policy mix and, and what is in, 
in the pipeline, also with the circular economy in the action plan, to try to identify some what are some of these uh, pathways that go along, along with this to provide the changes we need for a circular economy. Uh, we've looked at pathways that cover different phases of the life cycle and that cover different environment and, and climate impacts. In the middle here, you can see the three pathways. The first is a pathway on smarter use. Basically, the aim is to reduce unnecessary plastics uh, through uh, policies, uh, through uh, circular business models and change uh, consumption. This will uh, impact, uh, uh, for example, uh, on climate change, uh, on the leakage, uh, and on toxicity for, for humans and nature. The second pathway we've looked at is increasing circularity, which is, of course, the uh, center of the topic uh, today. Uh, and basically, the aim is how do we maintain plastic in the life cycle uh, uh, through circular business models uh, mainly, and, and how do we enable that whole thing uh, in Europe, which is, of course, a big challenge, and but also a huge opportunity, which will impact uh, the various uh, the various uh, effects on the environment and climate, leakage, pollution, etc. And then finally, we've looked at the renewable material uh, uh, pathway, basically to reduce the amount of plastic made from fossil fuels, uh, if when that is uh, possible, to to replace it by renewable uh, materials. So. Um, so that's our, our 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 contribution to to this debate at the moment, and uh, uh, I thank you for the, for listening, and I look forward to discussing a lot with others. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Lars, for this uh, presentation and for giving us a preview into the upcoming EA report. Uh, we will now have the pleasure to hear uh, the views um, of Sophie Sicard. Uh, Sophie is the Vice President of um, the Plastics Recycling Branch at uh, URIC, um, the European Recycling Industries Confederation, and she's um, um, an advisor to the General Manager of the BAPREC Group, a major multi-material recycling company in France. Um, she will highlight for us um, the challenges and need of the plastic recycling industry. <coughs> Sophie, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, first, I'd like to thank uh, Ipires for hosting the round table and for inviting me. Uh, I'd like also to, to thank um, our representative uh, Jean de Yotoma for this very, very comprehensive and interesting uh, overview of, uh, of his work and his uh, understanding of, of uh, the current state of, uh, of uh, plastic recycling challenge. Uh, that was very, very interesting. Um, uh, just to briefly introduce Eurek, so we are the European Recycling Industry Confederation. Uh, we uh, represent the business of uh, recycling, all branches of recycling, not only plastics, but also uh, metals and paper, papyrus, uh, all waste, uh, all waste streams, basically. Uh, we have a lot of uh, small and medium-sized uh, enterprise uh, among our membership, so we, we represent uh, more, almost uh, 6,000 uh, enterprises across uh, Europe. Uh, regarding the ESIC uh, report, uh, I'd like uh, really to, to thank uh, the team and Dr. Norton because uh, the work was very comprehensive, and uh, URIC APRB shares most of the conclusions and recommendations of the report. So, uh, as for as for the plastic recycling industry, I'd like to to make a point of what makes a waste uh, recyclable in real life. Uh, for for us, uh, there are uh, four criteria. Uh, the first, waste must be uh, collected. Uh, and uh, designed to be collected uh, into the existing system, it must be sortable, uh, fitted for the existing uh, sorting technologies, designed for recycling under the current uh, technologies, and sellable, meaning that there is demand for the recycled material at a price that covers the cost of the four uh, operations. 
Um, I'd like to focus on the two last points, meaning design for recycling and uh, demand, uh, which is currently uh, one of the most uh, uh, urgent uh, need of our industry. Regarding design for recycling, as uh, Dr. Norton uh, very clearly highlighted, the most you mix uh, plastic into a single packaging, the more difficult it will uh, it will be to recycle, and it, and in many cases it will make it impossible uh, to recycle. Um, the more the more the, the more the more you mix, the lower the quality of the output and the higher the cost of recycling. So we have uh, huge challenges on multi layers. And, uh, and complex uh, packages, um, mostly trays and uh, flexibles. Everyone, I think it's definitely working on the on this issue and brands are doing a lot of R&D and the packaging industry is really doing a lot of progress uh, presently. We have, uh, um, we have witnessed uh, works you know to to simplify uh, the composition and definitely this is this is very satisfying for the for the plastic recycling industry but it's still starting and there is a long long way uh, to go the recycling industry have organized and teamed up with all the all the value chain to to propose uh, design uh, standards uh, eco design standards so uh, APBP for bottles and Recyclas for for all uh, all plastic packaging are doing a great job, like to to give a clear view of uh, what uh, what we as recyclers expect uh, from uh, from the brand um, brands and plastic packaging uh, industry. Um, I just like to make a point regarding innovation because uh, sometimes uh, we hear that. Okay, recyclers, you are doing a recommendation, but what about uh, innovation in, uh, in in plastic packaging or in packaging on a more general basis? Uh, we are very pragmatic. We expect innovation to be thoroughly review, reviewed before it is placed on the market. Uh, obviously, innovation uh, can uh, can improve the the, the fate uh, and the recycling of. Um, of packages, but for instance, what we saw with opaque PET uh, in the past, that the the this innovative material was placed on the market without a thorough assessment of its impact on the recycling streams, and it causes really big damage and trouble to the to our recycling uh, PET PET recycling uh, uh, industry. And now we are currently working and finding new techniques to recycle, to recycle opaque PET. And we will be able very soon to have closed loop of opaque PET. Why this haven't been made in the beginning? And this is what we need to, 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 to make, to have a um, thorough assessment and a comprehensive uh, col collaborative view on innovation on uh, packaging. This is our first uh, and need, I would say, as recycling industry. Uh, second uh, is the demand for uh, recycled uh, material. Uh, as you as you may know, uh, today the European industry uh, only uh, only twelve percent of the materials used by the. Re uh, European industry is for is from uh, recycling. For plastics, it's even lower because it's only six percent. Why? For for the plastic industry, the the main factor uh, today uh, is the low price of oil. Basically, when recycling in Europe, you recycle with the cost of Europe. Uh, you recycle with the energy prices of Europe. You recycle with the um, with a lot of um, uh, workforce cost and with investment. We do not at all uh, rely on the oil prices. So we are competing with a material uh, which prices can be is highly highly variable in time and which 
and which have and which is really really much cheaper than what we can uh, afford as recyclers as Europe, european recyclers we we in during the covid crisis was we faced and we're still facing this very extreme situation where we are a double crunch on recycled plastic demand because of plant closures and also because of the drop of the virgin material prices. So what we need to, to support demand for our recycled material um, is a well, our preferred option at uh, at Zurich is a mandatory recycled content, uh, because as of today, uh, this is this is the option that has proved to be the most efficient. What we what we see today on the food contact uh, pet market is that we have um, we now have uh, an independent market since the single-use plastic directive have introduced this um, recycled content target of 25% by, 20, by 2025 and 30% uh, by 2029, we now have a price of a recycled uh, food contact PET, which is compatible with our recycling costs. And we have no demand challenges. So we do think that expanding mandatory recycled content to more products would definitely uh, be a, a huge um, uh, a huge progress to to, to increase recycle uh, recycling rates in, in europe our second option uh, is a commodulation of fees within epr schemes um, this is something that I've been experienced, which have some uh, some success to some extent to some extent. But presently, it is we see it as slightly less efficient than mandatory recycled content. But this is a very valuable option. Um, as for taxes on the virgin virgin uh, materials or. or well, we we are often asked what we what we think about taxes. We think it's a um, it's a signal and an incentive uh, for design for 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 recycling, but it should be definitely uh, complemented with more direct incentive on the on the recycled content. Uh, the last point uh, I would like to make is that uh, domestic EU demand will become more and more crucial uh, as we we are willing to to restrict uh, West uh, exports and restrict and even ban a landfill. I totally agree uh, with the, with uh, Professor Norton when we say we need a systemic change. If, we do need a systemic change, and we and we so we need to to act with a systemic view. You cannot just cut the export, cut the landfill, without pushing very much to have a strong domestic market. Um, definitely, if we have waste export today, is because. There is not uh, the the internal market for waste and secondary raw material is not functioning well enough. This is this is a uh, the this is what we witness as as as, uh, as recyclers. We will definitely like demand. I think I made that, that point quite clear. And we also need to have a more integrated uh, internal market with uh, end of waste. Um, procedures uh, harmonized at EU level to have a very uh, smooth flows uh, of materials, of quality materials in Europe, and uh, simplify shipment, shipment rules within the European Union. Um, finally, um, and once again, uh, I will definitely share the, the conclusions of, uh, of the previous speakers. Uh, we need to internalize the, the CO2 benefits from, from recycling and make it a competitive um, advantages. Uh, 
border adjustment mechanism have been announced. Uh, and definitely we would support um, an inclusion of the CO2 benefits uh, of recycling within the framework of this, of this border adjustment mechanism. Uh, recy recycling, uh, recycled material need a fair competition with imported uh, primary raw material. So we need to have a fair price of um, of primary raw materials, which are very often extracted uh, in conditions that are not quite uh, uh, coherent with, uh, with our um, European environmental standards. I hope this was useful and thank you again for listening. Um, thank you very much, uh, Sophie, for your intervention. Um, I will now turn to our third panelist, Justine Mayo. Uh, Justine is um, a policy officer at Zero Waste Europe and the policy coordinator of the European uh, NGO Alliance Resync Plastic, uh, which is part of the Break, from, uh, break Free from Plastic movement. Uh, so, Justine, how should we resync plastic in a circular economy? Hi everyone, thank you Vision for the introduction. Um, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation to bring the, the, the words of the civil society as well in the, in the panel. And thank you for the presentation, a uh, very um, interesting report uh, from ISAC and also very interesting to, uh, to know more about what the EA is focusing on. Uh, always good to get the, the perspective and the challenges of the recycling industry and uh, and very much interested into uh, the own initiative report uh, of the Parliament and, and following that uh, with with great interest. Um, so maybe just a few points uh, following up on on what was said, uh, with which you know a lot. I agree. I think what was said on systemic change, we we fully support that. And and one of the things we we really try to do within the the alliance and and the global movement together is is really looking at the whole value chain of plastic. And with the benefit of being a global movement, that means we can also see what's happening at the protection uh, level in the US, for example, with the consumption in Europe. And then uh, you know at the end of line, when uh, some of our um, packaging waste is exported uh, in Asia and, and other places. So that's that's for us something that is very key, looking at the whole value chain. Uh, and I think that was said also so today. And and the link with with climate and emissions is uh, indeed very clear. And I think it's becoming clearer and clearer. And and the role of climate policy and the link between plastic and climate policies is, is definitely uh, very important to to consider. And one thing that was also said uh, today, and that is uh, obviously, as you can imagine, very key to us is the need to focus on upstream solutions to solutions very much at the beginning of the chain. So focusing on reduction of the resource use and reuse uh, systems and, and, and reuse options, I would say. Uh, so basically this idea of designing out waste indeed. Um, and when it, we come talking about reuse, for example, uh, what is critical is obviously the design of the products, and that's clear, but it's also the design of the system in which those products are put on the market. Because if we just redesign pro uh, products, it may not work, or it may not bring the economic and, benefit, uh, and environmental benefits that um, that it could it would bring if we rethink the whole system of how we distribute some of the goods, for example, and some of the packaging, which is a little bit the focus of today. Um, so, of course, reuse targets, for example, for a number of sectors, policies like this could definitely support uh, the the switch to reuse, the transition to reuse products. But I think we also need to think about, you know, do we need, for example, harmonized packaging so that you can actually create proper pools of reusables and you 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 create scales of uh, economies of scales, that means that you get more and more actors around um, reuse and, and that would make the, the, the system much more beneficial for, for everyone. So it's it's about that as well. Um, I think the report shows quite strongly um, the, the role of deposit return scheme and we've seen it works quite uh, well, pretty well in, in countries for uh, recycling of bottles mainly, but there's also a role for deposit return schemes in reusable and refillable containers. But indeed, we need to look at which conditions then are needed for it to be very environmental beneficial um, and also for, for the business models to, to work. And we think the energy and the money should actually go into developing th those kind of models. Um, 
and what is really important or what we also have been uh, highlighting a lot is the, the risk of regrettable substitution and the need to be extra cautious with that because we also have seen companies and also consumers being happy to try to find an easy solution that would be changing just to buy or something. Um, and that's something that is very, uh, yeah, we need to be very cautious about that. It was also said today. And from an environmental point of view, but also uh, from a chemicals expect exposure point of view, and maybe that links to my second point, because there was again, uh, I think two uh, two weeks ago, a big report on, on chemicals uh, in plastic, uh, different plastic polymers and it was clearly showed for example that chemicals exposure through PLA is can be as uh, as high than other forms of plastic such as PVC um, and and I think that comes to my second point which is when we talk about redesign we also need to take chemicals and products very much into account because we cannot have a circular economy if it's not toxic free and so we need to make sure the products are safe for use for reuse for recycling and that really means looking into the chemicals and often that's a bit left on the side of the discussion on the circular economy and for us this is key we, we really like the idea of um, a passport uh, for products for example but that also needs to include elements around uh, chemicals composition and, and traceability um, and so for us this is very an important element there's need from the commission and from the decision makers and from all of us to look at really the links between the waste policies the chemicals policies the products policies and and continuing looking at this interface between that and and at the political level we, we need to make sure like the circular economy action plan and the um, chemical strategy for sustainability are going together in the same direction towards uh, toxic free circular economy and the last point i want to make very briefly is um, the role of investments and to a certain extent it links to uh, what was a bit discussed on innovation yes there's a, a need to you know find new solutions etc what we're calling for is looking at or putting the money where we really want the solutions to be and we always say we should focus on um, on the top of the waste hierarchy so reduction and reuse but we often see the money and the investment going to other uh, other solutions such as um, chemical recycling or trying to find the solutions there and we're not saying they're not part at all of the solution but we're saying there's definitely not a silver bullet and so we want to see um, money and investment R&D uh, going into developing those uh, reuse models and those systems uh, where indeed we, we could prevent waste from, from the start and really focus on, on reusability, repairability, etc. And, and it may not be as, um, in terms of technology, it may seem easier, but at, at the same time, technology definitely have a role to play there. If we decide to harmonize packaging, for example, well, then we need to find new ways to actually market and label products or to distinguish one brand to another. And there, there's a lot of things technology and digitalization can do as well. And so we would really encourage the money to go towards those solutions as well, rather than only focusing towards waste management. Um, and I will finish on that. Uh, looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Justine, for your intervention. And indeed, we received quite a few uh, questions in the Q&A. So um, uh, the very first question would be, I think, for Professor Norton. It's a question um, from Ludovica Serafini asking, uh, which could be the potential to use leftovers from agriculture to replace plastic packaging? Furthermore, there is the need to reduce prices for consumer on alternative to plastics, for instance, bee wrap for food. That would be the first question, Professor Norton, if you want to take it. Um, yeah. Um, well, does the questionnaire mean the use of agricultural residues as a raw material for plastics? <laughs> or has he, got, or he or she got some idea of using agricultural residues directly to make some form of you know, carbohydrate or straw-based uh, packaging. I'm not quite sure. But um, the, if it's just the uh, use of agricultural residues as a biofeedstock, then of course that can make uh, a lot of sense in some cases. But what you have to be sure of is that the scale you uh, proposing to use it for and the supply and the, uh, the stages of collecting and uh, purifying it 
are actually worth the energy you have to put in and give you a net environmental benefit. And uh, that's a sort of balance which can be quite difficult to calculate and which underpins uh, a lot of the problems in switching from a simple fossil fuel, however undesirable it may be from greenhouse gas emission, it's a very convenient raw material to a, a, a diverse and um, sometimes difficult to um, uh, collect and handle raw material. And, uh, and that, that, that trend always needs to be borne in mind. You must always make sure you get a benefit from your change of behaviour at the end of it and don't get sufficiently motivated <clears throat> just to change the label. You have to make sure you change the reality as well. Um, I, I can, if I make a, a brief comment on the <clears throat> the inputs from the three panelists, which I found very helpful, very very interesting. I think um, I, if I were trying to um, uh, strengthen the messages from a simple point of principle, I think what uh, everyone would probably agree with is there needs to be a change in mindset and a change in people's priorities uh, from the from the period we've had up to now, which is that recycling is either something you can be ignored or, oh dear, we didn't think about recycling, let's think about that after you've gone through your innovation cycle or your production cycle or your PR and marketing department. You need to start saying, well, recycling is not just an add-on, it's the starting point. You have to decide that first and then you go through the other parts of your priority list. So that's a complete mindset in change in the case of the production. And also it'd be nice to see a similar mindset in, 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 on the consumer in that when they, there should be a mindset that, that when I buy a product, it's not just the contents, I'm also responsible for the, con the, the, the packaging of the product. And so um, ideally with some materials, you can see them just on lane, on loan. So, when I buy a bottle of drinks, it's my job and my responsibility to ensure that that container is then disposed of properly or recycled or, or possibly reused. So there is a, a need to try and encourage this change of, uh, uh, of responsibility and the change in the mindset to avoid this uh, tendency which has happened up to now, oh, it's always someone else's problem when I finish making the use of it, I immediately want to use it for. Uh, just a, a general comment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Norton, for your reply and also for your comments on the other presentation. Um, we have um, just received another question uh, from Helmut Mora. Um, how do you think we should organize a systemic U-turn in order to curb overall plastic production? Currently, we are still moving towards 1.2 billion tons of plastic waste in 2050. Do we not pay too little attention to overconsumption of plastic? Maybe that's a question that uh, all panelists would like to, uh, to react on. Um, maybe starting uh, with uh, you, Professor Lawton, and then um, the other panelists. Oh, well, well, that's in, entirely one of the messages of our report is that the regulations have perhaps they've been very good, but they tend to, to uh, avoid the key part of the circular economy and the key part of the three R's or six R's hierarchy of the uh, reduce and reuse part. Uh, they've all focused very much on the recycling side. And one of our points is, as I mentioned in my first slide, is that the principles of the circular economy means we are aiming at reducing the flows of materials through the economy and improving eco-efficiency. So I thoroughly agree with the question, how do we do it? Well, you have to do it by incremental measures and uh, by measures which encourage people who do succeed in reducing flows and also in trying to increase the priority and the effort we give to these earlier stages of the three R's, the, particularly the reuse. And that, of course, is something which is going on. There are some innovative uh, plans um, at, at under development and actually being implemented. There's that loop system and gradually there are some experimental um, uh, approaches being used to uh, improve reuse. Um, that needs to be encouraged and, and and the success from those schemes rolled out as fast as possible.
I'm happy to follow up on that. I mean, um, thank you for the question. Fully agree and also uh, completely agree with uh, Professor Norton's um, response. So indeed, I think uh, there's a lot that can be done to, to start with, you know, the unnecessary plastic, I would say, and in packaging, there's quite a few of those that can just be, um, could just be removed and, and a lot of um, reusability and repairability that can, can be um, involved. And I think for, for the EU, for example, on packaging, the fact that uh, the EU will revise the, the conditions to put packaging on the market is an opportunity to to really uh, kind of get rid of the worst performance uh, packaging and really focus on, on reusability, repairability and, and recyclability. And one thing I would like to add on, on this question of of production it's also it's a, it's a global issue and probably we need to also look at what's happening in other regions uh, because the eu has been quite progressive in adopting quite a few legislation recently the plastic strategy uh, as a policy and, and directive on single-use plastic and and at least shows the intention to continue which is very positive but we also know that those products that may not be sold on the eu market anymore they will go to other markets um, and often in markets where there's very very little uh, policies, there may not be even an EPR system in place. Um, so I think when talking about production, um, we also need to, I think that it's important to think global and, and the role of, of possible global instrument as well to make sure we actually cap the production globally. Thanks. If I can come in now, is that all right? Yes, that's okay. So I think from my perspective, of course, this is the big million dollar question. How do we organize uh, this U-turn? I think there's two things in it. One is what has been mentioned already is the unnecessary use. Plastic, of course, is a wonderful for material for many purposes, but there are also many purposes for which it is, 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 is not so wonderful. For example, for, for single use or for use for a very short time or for little use and others. And, and I think it's important to look at that. The second thing that we have not discussed is what does it take? And I think it takes a lot on the circular business models. Huh? So the circular business models that takes uh, innovation, takes innovation in the types of business models that they run. It takes uh, technical innovation, you know, developing something complete new techniques. It takes social innovation, new ways of doing things. But then the, innov the innovation and the business models don't come by themselves. They need to be enabled by the policies, I think, and by, by financial support. So we, I think we need that mix. And I think with policymakers, it's important that they're really aware of this, that this, this doesn't as a, come by itself. It's really hard, as was mentioned earlier, that, you know, in some cases, if the recycling material cannot compete with the with the price of oil, it's really, really hard. So so I think there, there's a lot of policy support needed, obviously. Uh, just to say a few, a few words on that question, basically Europe is already showing the way, uh, as uh, as uh, Mrs. Mayer said, uh, with a single-use directive. We are already we already started to to tackle the the issue of of, um, of uh, unnecessary use of of, of plastics. Um, I think all this. Um, these solutions uh, reduce, reuse, and recycles are all uh, complementary one to one to each other, and um, definitely they will have this this systemic rethink and, and redraft of the use of of plastic has to 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 be based on these three options. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to all of you. Um, we have another question from, um, I, I think it would be for you, Sophie. Um, we have a question on uh, f from uh, Francesco Innocenti asking, um, one talks about recycling plastic as if it were a single material, while it's a mixture of different polymers that are incompatible, which is, which is with each other, <laughs> um, isn't it possible to um, to imagine that compost tables are just another class of polymers in the family? Well, compostables are not uh, recyclable. They are compostable, <laughs> or at least uh, they should. Um, presently. 
compostable compostable so at least the one we, we we have on the market we do not exactly know how to handle them because they are not or most of them they are not fully uh, compostable and we cannot include them into the plastic recycling industry because they are not recyclable uh, so what what should we do with them um, the, I think the report is really very straight to the point to the, to the status, current status of the of the bio bioplastic and biodegradable plastics. There, it is an option to be to be considered and investigated, but presently it is not some. It is not ready. If I if I have to to to, to put it uh, bluntly, and. We in Antiria, we, we, as I said, uh, we do not only really focus on plastic, but also in uh, bio waste is one of, of our of our focus. And we, what we, what we have as uh, in our daily operations is that bioplastics is more an issue than uh, than something that can be easily integrated into uh, composting and mechanization. Uh, Operations. Thank you very much. I think it was important to clarify the issue so that there is no misunderstanding. Um, we have a fully different question uh, from Joanna Vega asking, um, given the success of deposit reform scheme in returning rates and quality of the material, why do you think there is so much resistance in implementing this Europe-wide, at least for drink packaging? Uh, maybe I'm not sure, uh, Professor Norton, would you like to react on this? Yes, it's a very good question, uh, one that gets to the fundamental um, conflicts of interest that you have in this system. Uh, of course, um, as a, a logistical process delivering recycled materials, I think the evidence is it's highly successful. And uh, all the countries with a high recycling rate for beverage containers all use DRS. That's not to say you can't achieve reasonably high levels by other means. And I think uh, a recent meeting I, I attended through the web showed, um, I think, that Belgium achieves uh, something like 80% without a DRS. But as there's so many countries which have introduced a DRS and seen a, a rapid increase within one year in the recycling rate up to the, up to the level of 90%, which is in the Commission's um, 2030 target. So I think the evidence is there that it is the most effective. But of course, it involves discomfort and inconvenience and expenditures for other stakeholders. And the, uh, in, in the expenditures involved in implementing the uh, re, uh, recovery uh, machines, the uh, refunding machines, is quite expensive. And when you have uh, governments, whether they're local or national, that are motivated by short-term expenditure priorities, they tend to be rather reluctant to uh, engage in policies which which require a large upfront investment without short-term uh, benefits to the economy itself. So you have a conflict between short-term economic thinking and <clears throat> and a, a longer-term strategy, which is not just uh, uh, demonstrable in uh, the plastic series. You find it almost everywhere. So I think the evidence is definitely that that is the most effective way. It's also an effective way, of, I think, of maintaining purity because um, in some of the curbside collections with higher uh, recovery rates, you still get a higher chance of uh, contamination with other containers than you do in the machine which has a bar reading code and, and selectively choose the materials it accepts and refunds. Um, so I think the question is that you have to overcome some of the structural resistances to long-term thinking and basically uh, the re reluctance in some uh, government circles to justify expenditure on protecting social and environmental goods rather than short-term economic benefits. Of course, from the user point of view, it can be beneficial. It uh, creates a market for children to run around looking to improve their pocket money by picking up, uh, uh, picking up materials which have been thrown away. 
And so that can be a, a side effect, which some people might find very attractive. I know I would have done in my earlier years. Uh, would, would the other panelists like to, to react to this question? Uh, yes. Justine, or Sophie, you can <laughs> Or Justine, please. No, I, I don't know. <laughs> no, I, I just wanted to, to add um, a, a few words uh, because in, in French we had an extensive debate on the GRS uh, schemes uh, recently. Um, I think, at least, at least in, in France, the point is not so much DRS itself than the, the, the scope of DRS and how, how, we, how to handle all plastic waste, not only bottles. Uh, I think uh, resistance and reluctance arise uh, when the DRS schemes are only focused on PET bottles and I would say valuable re re recycling uh, plastic packaging, which are currently funding for all the collection of the of all plastic packaging, including low value packaging. So if and I think this is um, um, a worry that needs to be addressed is if uh, bottles goes to DRS, how do we fund for the collection of other plastic waste? which have no commercial value presently. So maybe JRS is simply not wide enough to be, uh, to be fully uh, acceptable for, for local, uh, local communities which need to fund the collection uh, of all waste and all plastic waste, not only bottles. Okay, so Justine? <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I agree with that. Uh, I just, uh, maybe in addition to what was said on that, um, to say that actually um, two days ago, I think um, the Soft Drink uh, Federation and the Federation of Bottled Water actually expressed the support for deposit return schemes for bottle. Um, and it just shows again the link also with, with policy um, and policy measures because they certainly did that uh, because uh, there's a new target for 90% of separate collection uh, for bottles in the single use plastic directive and also this uh, obligation to have recycled content. And we know that DRS are the best way to, uh, to get the separate collection and to have uh, clean or as clean as possible material. So it also shows the link between how how policies can also uh, push the, the the sector into a certain direction. Uh, yet I fully agree with the limitations that have, have been noted, and I think DRS is certainly one element where where there's uh, interest in looking into how we could scale this up in terms of scope as well, and also not just for recycling but also uh, for reuse um, as well. Thank you very much. I think we can take one last question. Um, so uh, we received a question uh, saying, what do you think of, of a product registration regime that would exclude unrecyclable and toxic plastic from the market? <laughs> I leave you like a few seconds to think about it. <laughs> Professor Norton, maybe? Sorry, I don't have any um, uh, information about that. So I don't think I can really comment. That's a new idea that has, has tried to come across my radar. Any other? <laughs> well, uh, we can only push for more design for recycling and less toxic uh, inputs, obviously. Um, then I guess it's more uh, for the plastic packaging and brand to, to answer these questions. Can I just add one point to Vivian, just uh, in addition to what has just been said? I yes, think the, the, the design for recycling is, is, is I think, is absolutely critical for, the, for this whole debate and for the solutions of this. So I think that's, so any, any policy initiatives that can enable 
the, the design for recycling and di distinguish which are designed for recycling, which are not, would, would, would be helpful because without the design for recycling, I think it's going to be it's going to be very difficult to meet the targets and objectives. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm just checking if we have more questions in the Q&A. Um, yes, we received a question about taxes, but I think uh, we've already um, dealt with the issue on um, yeah, what role should taxes play in curbing virgin production and supporting recycling? I think that we have touched upon the issue during the debate. So, um, yeah, so I think um, yeah. again, I, 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 with regard to the taxing, we do actually make the point in the report that um, the, the, the lack of uh, accounting for environmental costs of some of the feedstocks for uh, plastic monomer, particularly American shale gas, is a particularly large hole. Um, the uh, American shale gas regulation is relatively lightly um, um, regulated. Um, some of the key uh, extra costs that should be incurred, like a methane collection, are being relaxed or, or we're never very tight in the first place and some of the other requirements on legislation like post uh, use closure of the well and res restoration are often avoided by um, bank bankruptcies and other means and so there is a, a, a big a big gap there in terms of uh, between the market price and what we would call as the social price um, and uh, the only way of uh, operating on that would either be a uniform carbon tax, which is a, uh, motivated by a climate change policy, which is applied across the world. And of course, that's not happening now. And so as a short term pollution, a uh, short term solution, the uh, plastic tax does have some justification in terms of trying to overcome some of those inherent shortages. But of course, if we could harmonize uh, a uniform approach to climate change based on a, a, a realistic carbon tax, then that would have a slight side effect of uh, 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 taking away some of this um, uh, dis unjustified disadvantage of virgin material. Okay. So, does anyone wants to react on this? Or if not, we will just uh, um, conclude the event. Um, so I would like to thank uh, all our speakers uh, for uh, their participation and also all the attendees for their attention and their numerous questions. Uh, thank you also to EASAC and to the EPRS team who made this event possible, in particular um, my colleague um, Anne-Cécile Charlier, our event manager, and my colleague Enrique Simoes, who managed the Q&A. Um, so, uh, I hope that uh, we will see uh, you at one of our next events. Our next event will take place on Wednesday, 